So Hebrews chapter 10, of course, this is uh, one of those passages a lot of times that I think uh, people struggle to understand. I know it's something in the past that I have struggled to understand there uh, in those latter verses where it talks about, uh, you, you know, specifically beginning at verse 26, for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. And I've heard people get up even in Baptist churches and say, you know, if you go out and you get saved and you sin willfully or you live a wicked life and knowingly that, that you could even lose your salvation. Now, of course, uh, we always need to, whenever we're reading the Bible, interpret the things we don't understand by the things that we do understand. You know, when we've been shored up on a doctrine, we know something to be true, um, you know, and we come into a, another passage or that's difficult for us to understand, that should not shake what we do understand. Now, of course, we understand that salvation is eternal. That eternal security of the believer is, uh, you know, what we believe here. That, uh, you know, that we are passed from death unto life. That God has, uh, you know, uh, born, uh, has given birth to us again, the spiritual birth. That we are part of God's family. That we are His children. That that can never change. Amen. Um, and a lot of people, you know, even with understanding that, that knowledge of knowing the eternal security of the believer, that, uh, that God has, you know, sealed us, that God has preserved us uh, unto the day of redemption, uh, even when they run into passages like this, can still let that uh, trip them up. Because a lot of times, even uh, when we understand these things, until it's really deeply embedded in our thinking, um, we can still struggle. We can still go back and say, well, did I miss something? Or... It could trip us up. I know uh, when I, before I, the first sermon I'd ever heard by, from Pastor Anderson was Repent of Your Sins, uh, Heresy Exposed. Amen. And that sermon drew a line in the sand for me. Yeah. Um, that was an issue that had come up in my church several times over the years, and I never really knew where to, I mean, if you pin me down and say, do you need to, to be sorry for your sin to be saved? I would have said no. But, uh, you know, my church had taught that. I'd seen other people that were, uh, that opposed that doctrine and rightfully so uh, leave the church people that I were close to and I, and I really struggled with that doctrine for a while that understanding and the problem was is I never heard anybody speak from the other side saying no you don't have to repent of your sins every time I tried to question it um, you know I'd always go to a, a, a source that would say that would promote that doctrine and I was always leave confused and uncertain of what I really believed now when I got saved I certainly didn't believe that I knew that much right and I can see how people, even after they get saved, they start to think, you know, they start to get things right in their life, they start to clean up their lives, and now they feel like they have to maybe make that a requirement. They can fall into that trap, that way of thinking. The point I'm trying to make is, even after I got that right, even after I heard that sermon, even after I moved out here to uh, Phoenix to attend Faithful Word and, and sat under the preaching, you know, it took a while for me to get away from being afraid of that word repent. You know, every time I, I couldn't cross that in my Bible reading, and it was like that old way of thinking would just pop up. The old, all the old arguments would come in and say, well, did, are we really believing correctly here? But, you know, sure enough, over time and study and listening to the preaching of the Word of God, you know, I've been shored up. I've been I made sure on that. I mean, you can't, I won't waver on that doctrine. So, you know, there's doctrines like that, and I'm just using that as an example um, as to why some people can still, even though they understand the eternal security of the believer, they can read a passage like this, or somebody else that, that, that believes you can lose your salvation will turn them to a passage like this and try to trip them up by saying, hey, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. You know, if you sin willfully, you can lose your salvation. Now, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that in this passage. It doesn't say, you know, you're, you will lose your salvation. Nothing, nothing even like that. And a lot of times we can spend, uh, you know, we will in the beginning of the sermon uh, talk about uh, why that's not the case, why that's not what this passage is teaching. And, and, and that's an important aspect to, to, to focus on when we're looking at this, this passage. But really, when we look at this passage and we understand what it is saying, what the truth of this passage is, there is a very powerful truth in here that I believe that if we can get a gra if we can grasp it and understand it and, and, and know it to be the truth and to make it a part of our lives, this will change the way we live for God. This will change our behavior and our walk with God. I believe that. I believe there's a very important truth here that, you know, that we need to get, and that it's important that we rightly divide the word of truth, that we rightly understand this passage here. So uh, the title of the sermon this morning is Fear, Love, and Obedience. Fear, Love, and Obedience. And really, that's what this passage is about. It's about fear, it's about love, and it's about obedience. 
Now, what I want to start out, of course, as I already kind of said, is that I want to address the fact that this passage addresses believers and not the lost. You know, another way this is commonly twisted is that people will say, uh, or misinterpreted, people say, well, that's talking to unbelievers. That's talking about people who aren't saved. Well, that's not true. This is actually talking to believers. That's who this is being addressed to. And we find the proof of that right in the text itself. For example, if you look at verse 14, it says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And of course, that's talking about Jesus giving himself a sacrifice for our sins. And it says that when he did that by the offering of himself, that one offering that he made one time, he perfected, he made us whole, he made us perfect forever. You know, that, that was that one time is all it takes. And when he gets saved, it's forever. And he hath uh, for perfected them forever that are sanctified. Now Jesus did here, what we see in this passage is that Jesus did, and what this passage is explaining is that he did what the law could not do. It says there in verse 1, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer up year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. It's saying it can't do it. It can't make them perfect. Even though they offer it year by year, it says they can, that those Old Testament sacrifices can never make those people perfect. Look at verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So he's saying here what, what the law could not do and that it was weak, Christ has done and that he was perfect and was able to give himself a sacrifice for all. As it says again in verse 14, for by one offering... He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Amen. This passage is showing us that the law can never make us perfect. And then it goes on and explains that through Christ we are sanctified once for all, forever. We are made perfect in Christ. That's what this passage is teaching. We, all, we see other uh, pass or, uh, parts of this passage uh, that, that show us very clearly that this passage is addressing believers. Look at verse 29. It says, Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. So it says that this, these people who are treading under the foot of the Son of God that they were sanctified. Now, it's under, important to understand what does sanctified even mean? It means to be set apart specifically in Scripture unto God. And if you would look at, uh, keep something there in Hebrews, but turn back to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13. 13. Let's let the Bible define this morning what sancti uh, sanctified even means. You're looking at Exodus chapter 13. Look at verse 1 where the Bible reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast. So he's saying you need to sanctify it, right? Well, look how he uses that. He talks about doing the same thing with a different term in verse 12. That thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that uh, openeth the matrix. So we see here that being sanctified is the same thing as being set apart, being separated. Being set apart specifically, as it says here, set apart unto the Lord. So to be sanctified means to be set apart unto God. So we see that this passage, you can go back to Hebrews chapter 12, 10, excuse me. Hebrews chapter 10, that we are, when we are sanctified, that we are actually set apart unto God. And that these people that have trodden underfoot the word of the, 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 the Son of God have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith, wherewith he was sanctified. These are sanctified people that we're talking about. These are believers in Christ. You see, when we get sanctified, and if you would go actually turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to, have to turn around a little bit here this morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you know, sanctification is an important subject. And, and, and it shows us a lot of things about salvation. In fact, if you look there in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 6, we'll see that when a person is sanctified, when they are set apart unto God, they're, they are justified before God. It says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So to be sanctified is to be justified. And look at uh, Jude chapter 1. We'll see also that when we're sanctified, not only are we justified, not only are we set apart unto God, but we are also what the Bible calls preserved. Preserved. Look at Jude chapter 1 verse 1. 
Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Christ Jesus by and by the Spirit of our God. So when we get sanctified, that's, 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 that, that, that encompasses a lot. There's several things that take place when we are sanctified, when we are washed by the blood of Christ. Not only are we sanctified, set apart unto God, but we are actually justified before God and we are preserved by Jesus Christ himself Amen. under the day of redemption. Now, if you would, turn back to Hebrews chapter 10. There's other uh, proofs within the text itself that show us that this is addressing believers. Look at verse 30. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. So, no doubt, this is a passage that's talking about God judging people. But specifically, it's talking about him judging his people. That's why it's, it's making this reference here. Look at verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. This is Paul including himself in this number of people. He's saying if we, he's speaking to believers, there's no doubt about it, that this passage is addressing believers specifically and not the lost. Now, if you notice again, uh, it said there that God will judge his people. And really, that's what this passage is talking about. I mean, that's the primary emphasis, I believe, is that God is talking about the fact that if we sin full willfully, God is going to judge us. You know, and that's a big criticism that people like to throw our way simply because we believe that salvation is by grace through faith. Somehow they go from you saying, oh, you believe salvation is easy. Oh, you believe in easy believism. Yes, I do. Amen. And you can throw that term on me and I will embrace it and I will I, send me a button yeah. and I'll wear it. I believe in easy believism. Because believing is easy. You know, and, and sometimes the critics, they'll catch on to that and they'll realize how stupid that sounds to sit there and say that, that, that uh, believing is, isn't easy. That somehow, you know, you, you know, believing in Christ should be difficult. They'll say, oh, you believe in easy believism. Yeah. You throw it back in their face. Yes, I do. They'll go, oh, we've got to change that. So now they, there's another popular term they like to throw, which is quick prayerism. They go from easy believers. Well, we know believing is easy, but you guys practice quick prayerism. I've never even done that. I don't even know what that is. Now, I will say there is an element out there that does practice that, but it's not us. It's not this church. You know, I've spent 20, 30, 40 minutes with people. You know, I've spent a lot. I've spent an hour with people going over, it, going through the gospel. I spent time with people going through the gospel, being thorough, making sure they understand that they're a sinner. All, you know that that salvation is by grace through faith, that it's eternal, that it's a gift, that you can't lose it, and going through it, and then still not getting it, and yeah. not praying with them and walking away. Yeah. You know you can't you can't say at least for myself, and I trust everyone in this church as they have been taught if they're doing it the way that it's, they've been instructed from 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 the pulpits, is that. We practice a thorough gospel presentation at this church, you know, and they like to throw that in our face and say, "Well, you guys just believe you can, uh, you know, do whatever you do whatever you want without consequence." That's another criticism that we get. They'll say, "You know, well, you just believe all you got. All you got to do is just believe in Christ, and you're safe." Yeah, Amen. It's easy to be saved. Yeah. For that's why the Bible says, "For God so loved the world that He gave." You give a gift, friend. You don't. You don't charge for it. That's, that's how we know God loves us, because salvation is easy. But people will throw that criticism at us. They'll say, well, you're saying that you can live however you want. No, Hebrews 10, as we're going to see here, makes it very clear that we as saved people, though salvation is easy, there are dire consequences if we go out and yeah. sin willfully against the Lord. Right. And, you know, it, it, that's not something we should try to test out to see if it's true. Right. We should just believe the Bible, what it says, and say, you know what, I, I, I would rather not go through that. So this passage here, as well as others, I mean, we could go over to Hebrews chapter 12. We're not going to. We will talk a little bit about it later in the sermon. Make it very clear that uh, God deals with people uh, by punishing them here on this earth. That he will punish his people. That he will judge his people on this earth. I mean, look at verse 29. Of how much sore punishment, suppose he shall he be thought worthy. There is a, you know, there is a, por there is a punishment for our sins. And then there is a sore punishment, isn't there? It sounds like there's degrees to the, the, the uh, to which we can be punished. Yeah. Now we might be, you know, we're not going to get away with sin. You know, uh, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. But you know, the, God takes some things into account. We're going to talk a little bit about, you know, there's different types of sinning. There's different ways we go about sinning, and depending on how it is that we've come to be uh, found 
you know, guilty of breaking God's commandments, that makes, plays a big part in how God is going to judge us and to what degree we're going to be punished. And he says here that, there, that he has a sore punishment, uh, the person that has trodden underfoot the Son of God and account of the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. Somebody who is sanctified, justified, preserved, saved is being receiving a sore punishment. God judges his people. And really, you say, well, I don't know about that. That seems kind of harsh. But really, it makes perfect sense when we consider how it is that we are justified. How is it that we come to the place in our life that we're justified, that we're sealed, that we're preserved, that we're sanctified? <clears throat> well, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, I'll read to you where it says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. See, our sanctification didn't come cheap. You know, we, 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 we say this phrase a lot that salvation is free. And it's free to us. But it costs God His Son. It costs Jesus His life. You know, we don't believe that, that grace is cheap. You know, it's, it's, it's free because He paid for it. He's the one that paid for it with His own blood. So we have to understand that when God is... Uh, you know, sacrificing His own Son when He's sanctifying us through the blood of Christ and we decide to go out and live a, a willfully sinful life and cast off the things of God and do those things which we know we ought not to do that displease Him, don't, it shouldn't come as a surprise when we receive a sore punishment. <clears throat> if you would, turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And it's important to understand this because in a lot of churches today, people are even teaching now that we are not under the law, we are under grace. And they, they, they take that to mean that we can do whatever we want. For there is no condemnation uh, to them which were in Christ Jesus. But they forget to go on and read where it says, that walk not after the flesh. <clears throat> if we walk after the flesh, whether you're in Christ or not, you're going to receive punishment. And if you're in Christ, if you are saved, and you decide to walk after the flesh, this passage here is showing us that we are going to receive a sore, sore punishment. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. And why do we receive that sore punishment? Because of what it took to sanctify us. And if you call on the Father, look at verse 17, if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation, uh, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He's saying, you know what? If you should live your life here, sojourning, passing your time here in fear. In fear. In fear, it says. That's the way to live your life. To be afraid. Because of the fact that you were purchased with the precious blood of Christ. That's what sanctified you. That's what sealed you. That's what preserved you was the blood of Christ. We should pass the time of our sojourning in here because as it says back in our text, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If you would, turn over to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And we love the promise here in John chapter 10, don't we? We'll quote this. This is a great verse about the security, uh, the eternal security of the believer. Where it says in John chapter 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. No man is able to pluck out of my Father's hand. We love to be in the Father's hand. We love to have the Lord uh, hold us in His hand and know that He will never forsake us and never leave us. But don't forget that the Bible also says it's a fearful thing to fall in the hand of the living God. We have to remember salvation is free, yes, but it's because Jesus paid for it. Yeah, that's right. The Bible says in Acts 20, I'll read to you, it says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the flock which, uh, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. You know, Jesus Christ purchased the church. He didn't do it with silver. He didn't go with gold. He didn't go take out a loan. He didn't go, you know, he went and paid for it with his own blood. So, yeah, we're, we love the fact that it's because of his sacrifice that we're held in his hand, but you have to remember something now. He purchased us. That's why we're in His hand this morning. That's why we can say that He has us, that He'll never leave us, He'll never let us go, that no man should be able to pluck us out of His hand. And that gives us great assurance. That gives us great comfort. 
And at least it should to know that salvation has been purchased for us. It's been purchased through His blood. But I'm telling you something. When somebody buys something, they own it. It's theirs. It's their property. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you this morning, if you've been saved, if you've been sanctified, if you've been preserved and all these things, if you have put your faith in Christ and He has you in His hand, you're His. Yeah. And that, that's, that can be a comfort because it also, if we get out of line, yeah. you know, God pays attention to His property. He doesn't like it to see it. He doesn't want it to get vandalized. He wants to take care of it, maintain it, and do what it takes. When you buy something, you own it. Look over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. People say, oh, I'm saved. It's great. And I can do whatever I want. It doesn't matter what I do now. All my sins are under the blood. Amen. It doesn't matter how I live. That's where you're wrong. It does matter how you live. Not just before men, but before God Himself. I mean, if God has you in His hand and you're His, He's not just going to let you get away with with." with sin in your life. Right. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God? Look, the body, the Holy Spirit is what you have of God. He gave it to you. He goes on and says this, and ye are not your own. You know, if, the, if He has you in His hand this morning, it's because you're not your own. Right. For ye are bought with a price. And we looked at those verses earlier. As of a, as of a, you know, the precious uh, blood of Christ of a lamb without spot or blemish. That's the price that was paid for you, for your soul. You are bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You're not your own this morning if you're saved. Yes, you're in His hand. No man can pluck you out. But that means you're His and that He owns you. And if you choose to not glorify God in your body, as we're told to do, if you choose to not glorify God in your spirit, which we're commanded to do, if you choose not to glorify your God because you are His, you are treading underfoot the Son of God this morning. If you're going to say, I'm going to live however I want, I'm going to do however I want, you are going to count the covenant wherewith you are sanctified an unholy thing and say, well, it doesn't really matter. It really wasn't that big of a deal. It doesn't matter that I'm God's this morning. It doesn't matter that He owns me. I don't care. And you're going to trod underfoot the Son of God. <clears throat> I mean, look here in our text. Go back to Hebrews 10. Look at all of the admonishments that Paul gives in light of the fact that we are not our own, that we are bought with a price, that we are sanctified as the, as of the blood of as of, as of the, with the blood of the Lamb. Look there in verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter in the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Let us hold fast, it says, verse 23, in the profession of our faith without wavering. Look at verse 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Look at verse 25. Not forsaking the assembly, uh, 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 the assembly of ourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another. Look, there's all these admonishments of the things that we ought to do. We ought to draw near to God. We ought to hold fast at profession. You know, not just, you know, say, say I'm saved, but it doesn't matter. But we should actually hold fast at profession and live the Christian life. We should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of our, as some is, but exhorting one another. I mean, that's a, that's a heavy verse right there. I mean, that sounds like church attendance to me is important. Yeah. That right. being in the house of God matters to God. I mean, he purchased it with his own blood. Yeah. And I, I know sometimes we get busy and, and life takes us out, but if we're in the habit of missing church, where th the other things are more important than us getting out to church, I'm not saying you have to be here every single service. But if we can't get out at least once a week, we can't make it a Sunday morning, Sunday night. You know, three to thrive, I think three, the more the better. You know, in the Old Testament, in the book of Acts, they were assembling daily. You know, and we're, and we're living in even more perilous times. And I understand that life, you know, the world, we have to go out and earn a living and do these things. But church attendance is important. Living for God is important. You know, doing the things that we ought to do. Not just church attendance, but all the whole spectrum of the Christian life. These things matter. Why? Because you've been bought. Because you're not your own. Because you're sanctified. And if you disregard these things, you are treading underfoot the Son of God. As, 
as a believer. That's something a believer can do. We ought to do the things that we ought to do. That's what this is really saying right here. You know what? You need to do what you need to do. That's really what it comes down to. Look at Romans. Uh, actually, go to uh, 1 Corinthians 7. The Bible says in Romans 6, Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into His death, that as like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You know, if we're been, if we're been uh, you know buried with Him by baptism into death, if we're if we're saying, hey, I identify with the death, burial, and resur resurrection of Christ, I'm a new creature in Him, then you ought to walk in newness of life. You know, I heard a quote recently. I, I really did, I've been thinking about it. It really um, set. It's really set in. It's just something I've kind of thought about. And uh, I can't remember. Who, I don't know if it was Thoreau or I can't remember who it was. It might have been Thoreau. But he said. Uh, Oh, what you are screams so loudly in my ears, I cannot hear what you say. You know, we can tell people we're a Christian till we're blue in the face, but when they look at our lives, is that what they're going to see? And that's really how people, you know, judge other people. It's not so much by what they say. It's about what, it's about how, what they do. Oh, I'm a Christian. I believe in Christ. And, you know, you do. I'm saved. And you are. But when we look at your life, it doesn't line up. There's no newness of life there. And the heathen, the unbeliever, says there's no difference. What well, does it matter? It doesn't, it doesn't change life. It's not going to fix my problems. It's not going to get me off the drugs. It didn't get him off the drugs. It didn't get this so-called Christian away from the filth of the world. So why should I? Why should I even bother? It's important that now you can see why God might come down so harsh on his children. Yeah. Because we are to be a light unto the world. That we are to be a city that is set on a hill. We are the salt of the earth. And when we don't do those things where we have lost... Our Savior, our Savior, you know, what, what good are we? Yeah. Right. To be cast out and trodden underfoot of men. That's all we're worth. You're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, look at verse 17. But as God hath distributed every man, as the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all churches. You know, we ought to walk in this life. We ought to walk in the things that God has given us to do. Colossians chapter 2 says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. If you receive Christ this morning, are you walking in Him? Are we doing the things that we ought to do? Or are we, or are we treading underfoot the Son of God? Or are we counting the covenant wherewith we are sanctified in the Holy Thing? Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. The Bible says in 1 John, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. There are so many admonishments in the Word of God not only to get saved by the free salvation to us in Christ to accept that free gift that God offers us but there's many admonitions to after that to live for Christ. To walk as he himself has walked. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 2. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now it doesn't say we must walk in them. It doesn't say we have to walk in them. It just says that we should. You know, a Christian can, can uh, uh, be created in Christ Jesus. They can be born again a new creature and decide, I'm not going to walk in after the, the, the works that God had uh, ordained that I should walk in. Yeah. I'm not going to do those things that God would have me to do. The Bible says in John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that really shows us the true heart of a person. If they really love God, and they're not just putting on a show, they're going to keep His commandments. And it's not going to be because somebody made them or somebody told them to. It's going to be because they want to. Right. Now, before we get into, again, the title is Fear, Love, and Obedience. And before we get into those aspects of the sermon, we do still need to address the fact of this one question. is What does it mean to sin willfully? Now, we have to understand, if we're going to sin willfully, you know, there, we have to understand, first of all, that not all sin is willful sin. You know, and we should never want to sin, but the fact is, you and I are flesh and blood. And we're weak, and we're frail, and we're feet of clay, we're going to slip up, we're going to mess up, and we're going to commit sin. The question is, is it willful or not? The question is, is it something you, you, you know it's wrong, you shouldn't do it, but you don't care, and you're going to do it anyway. 
It's something you could resist. It's something that you could get away from. It's something that you could cut out of your life. It's something that you could get right with God, but you don't want to. That's willful sin. We sin often sometimes because of the fact that we're weak. We're just weak. We're sinful flesh. Isn't that what Jesus told Peter? He said, watch and pray that you enter not in temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And sometimes we want to do the right thing. We strive to do the right thing. We don't want to sin. But our flesh is weak, and we do it anyway. And God understands that there's moments of weakness. It's not an excuse. It's just the fact of the matter. It's the way it is. If you would turn over to Romans chapter 7. The Bible says in Galatians 5, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh, flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. You know, if we let the flesh get out of control, we're not going to do the things that we could do, even the things that we want to do in the inner man through the Spirit. Look at verse, uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 14. I mean, Paul knew the struggle of weak flesh and a willing spirit. He said in verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, uh, for that which I, do I allow not. But that what I, for what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for, will, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. It's kind of a tongue twister. He's saying, look, I want to do the right thing, but I don't. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Those things I don't want to do, I find myself doing them. I find that a law, it says in verse 21, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I, uh, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity of the law and sin of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. I mean, that's an exclamation point here. He's crying out. This is a real struggle that Paul went through. Yeah. You know, the stupidity to say that once you get saved, you never, you, you never sin. It sounds like Paul struggled with it every day. Of his life. That it was a battle. He said, I die daily. Yeah. The problem with a lot of us is that we say, I don't die daily. They don't have this struggle. They don't say, oh, wretched man that I am. They say, those things that I would not, I do, and I don't care. I'll do it, and I feel good about it, and it doesn't bother me. And I'm going to do it again tomorrow and the next day. And that's when it becomes willful. You see, that we sin often because of the fact that we're weak, that we're in the flesh. And though we want to do the right thing, sometimes we just find ourselves, how did that even happen? Lord, forgive me. And a lot of times, we'll know the difference between the two and how we react to it. When sin is finished and brought forth death, does it bother us? Do we find ourselves, I don't want to do that again? I'm trying to go to God and get it right? <clears throat> Sometimes we, swim, we sin because of the fact that we're ignorant. Not only because we're weak, but sometimes we just don't know that what we're doing is sinful. Or what we're not doing is something we should be doing. To him that knoweth the good and doeth not, it is sin. There's things that we ought to be doing and we don't do. And we don't even realize it. And we're sinning. We sin because we're weak and we're sinning because we're ignorant a lot of times. And for sake of time, I won't go there, but if you, go to, if you would read Leviticus 4, or Numbers 15, you would see where God prescribes. Actually, you know what? Go to, go to Numbers 15. In Leviticus 4, he says, look, if, if you sin ignorantly, if there's a sin of ignorance, they were to bring a sacrifice. If it's found out, if they go later and they say, oh, I didn't even realize this. Well, we've committed a trespass against the Lord without even knowing it. They were to get that right. That's a sin of ignorance. That's not just being weak. That's not a willful sin. There's a difference. Look at uh, Numbers chapter 15. Look at verse 29. Ye shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. But the soul that doth, uh, ought, excuse me, doth ought presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or of a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord. That's interesting terminology that he's using here. He reproaches it. He goes on and says here, because he hath despised the word of God. It sounds a lot like Hebrews 10. Somebody who has done respite 
under the Spirit of grace. They have despised the Lord. Why? Because they sinned willfully. Because they have done that presumptuously. Because they have despised, they have reproached the Lord. <clears throat> it says, And he hath broken his commandment. The soul shall be utterly cut off. His iniquity shall be upon him. There's no sacrifice to be made. You know, if, if, they're, if they're doing something willfully in the Old Testament, that's a harsh judgment. But that's exactly the point God is trying to make here, even in the New Testament, that sinning willfully brings a sore punishment. I'm not saying, you know, if you sin because you were weak, or if you sin because you were ignorant of something, that God is just going to give you a pass. I mean, God will show mercy to him who show mercy. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But if we're just going to go out and sin willfully and do those things, sin presumptuously and say, I know this is wrong, and I could, I could, I could go and not, I could uh, keep myself from doing this, but I want to do it so bad that I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. There's going to be a sore punishment. <clears throat> we, you know, there's other examples we could look to, and for sake of time, we won't. The example of uh, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, who knowingly went and lied into the Holy Ghost. And what happened to them? They dropped dead. Yeah. Right there in God's house for God's man. They lied in the Holy Spirit, and they were both killed. That's a sore punishment for somebody who willfully, knowingly sinned. Do you think they forgot that they, they held back part of the price of the land? If you know, you know the story I'm referring to in Acts 5, where they sold the land and they kept back part of the price thereof and said, oh, we sold it for this much to try and get the praise and the glory of, of men, to try to look like they're some big shots or something. And uh, they lied to the Holy Ghost in the process, knowingly, willfully, presumptuously, and God kills them. We're all going to be punished to some degree for our sin. But if we're sinning willfully, I'm telling you, the Bible says it's a sore punishment. But we're all going to be punished. No one's going to get away for it, uh, for the sin in their life. It says there in Hebrews 12, I'll read to you, it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Every son, every child, everyone that comes, because of the fact that we're all sinners. We all have sin in our life, and we're going to have to get right. And God is going to chasten us to some degree or another. Now, the degree of that chastening depends a lot upon, you know, what kind of sin we have in our life and whether or not that's a willful sin. I mean, if we're sinning willfully, you know, I, I remember growing up, and I, could, I have a few memories from my childhood, but I can remember this one as clear as day. I'm standing in the hallway and looking into my mother's bedroom, and she's in there, and I have, I have the, the vacuum is next to me, and she's looking at me, and she moms have a way of just like reading children's minds. They can look at your face, and they can know what you're about to do, and tell you not to do it before you even thought of it. She says, "Don't you step on that vacuum?" Because I was gonna jump on it or ride it. I don't know why this made her so mad, <laughs> but it did. And I looked right at her, and I went, <laughs> and she got mad. <laughs> and you know what? <laughs> if she had just walked into the room and found me doing it, she probably wouldn't have been as upset. Yeah. But she warned me. He said, don't you do that. Yep. And I did it. And then she was really mad. There was a sore punishment. I had the same way with my kids. If I told them, don't do this, and they had a clear understanding of what the, where the line was drawn, and they just went to see what I would do about it. You better believe they're going to find out real quick it wasn't worth it. Yeah. And they're going to, I mean what I said. And it's the same way with God. I mean, God, we have the whole, you know, the Bible here... <laughs> And God puts us in church, admonishes to be there, the preaching comes down, that we read our Bibles, we start to see what God expects of us, what's allowed, what's not is allowed, what the things we ought to be doing. And sometimes I think we just kind of go, well, I'm going to do it anyway. And if that's us, I'm telling you, you're sinning willfully against God, and don't let it surprise you when there's a sore punishment. You know, the Bible does talk about the fact that people, even saved people, can become His enemy. I mean, even us in this more in this room this morning, we can become the enemy of God. If you would turn over to James chapter four. James chapter four says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, look at verse four, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. I mean, if we're gonna side with the world, we're gonna become the enemy of God. Whosoever that will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. It says, whosoever, meaning anybody, any one of us, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. We'd say, well, that means salvation is for everybody. Well, whosoever will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. 
And I don't care if it's a King James only independent fundamental Baptist preacher. If he's going to get up and side with the world over God's word, yeah. mark it down, that man is an enemy. Amen. Right. <clears throat> right. But we can do that even in our own lives. It says again in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, For if we sin willfully, that we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries, the enemies. That's what it's referring to. You see, when we know we're doing the wrong thing, and, and we, sometimes we think we're getting away with it, we can't help but look over our shoulder and make sure we're not about to get caught. And we'll all, you know, we get that fearful looking about for fiery indignation and wrath, which is going to devour, uh, devour the adversaries. We know when we're doing the wrong thing. We know when we should, when we're not doing what we ought to be doing. <clears throat> and you know, it makes us, it makes us afraid. At least it ought to, because if we're, if we're, you know, if we're not following after Christ, and we're becoming the enemy of God. I mean, I can think of a lot of people I'd rather have as my enemy than God. I mean, I'd rather climb in the ring with the biggest, baddest dude there is and go try to go as long as I go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them before I ever want to be the enemy of God. Yeah. <clears throat> you say, well, that sounds scary. Boy, it sounds like God's kind of a scary God. Yeah. Man. He is. Yeah. <laughs> it is a fearful thing to fall in the lands of the living God. And, but here's the thing. You know, the world wants to paint this pic this negative picture uh, about fear. You know, no fear. That's that's a, that's a moronic statement. <laughs> yeah. You're an idiot to believe that. You shouldn't be afraid of anything. Some fears are unfounded, but the fear of God certainly isn't. And let me tell you something. Fear is a powerful motivator. I mean, fear will motivate people. The fear of being caught doing the wrong thing will cause you to do the right thing. If you're truly afraid of it. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, or the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning. The title of the sermon this morning is Fear, Love, and Obedience. You know, fear is a powerful motivator, and it's something that we should have in our life, especially if we find ourselves walking contrary to God, willfully sinning against Him, despising the commandments, despising the Lord in our hearts. We would never say it with our mouths, but again, what we do speaks so much louder than what we say. Yeah. <clears throat> and fear is a powerful motivator, but it's the beginning. You know, I, I, I want my kids to fear me, yes. If they're going to do wrong and step out of line, they should be afraid. Yeah. And it's the same way with us. And I want my kids to obey me, even if it means they're going to obey me solely because they're afraid of me. Yeah. I'll take it. But it's the beginning of knowledge. We should get to the point in our life where we obey God, yeah. not because we're afraid of Him, but because we love Him. If you love me, keep my commandments. Fear is a powerful motivator, but I mean, hopefully we're not living our entire Christian life just because we're afraid of God. Hopefully we get to the point in our life where we mature enough and say, you know what, I want to serve God and do what's right because I love Him. Because I understand that what it took to sanctify me. And I love the fact what Jesus Christ did for me. I love the price that was paid for my redemption. And I'm going to serve God not because I'm afraid of Him, but because I love Him. <clears throat> if you would, let's look at uh, Psalms chapter 103. Psalms chapter 103. I mean, if it takes, I mean, if, if fear is all, the only thing that's going to get the job done, by all means, let's, let's do it out of fear and let the love come later. <clears throat> Psalms 103, look at verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, nor will He keep His anger forever. He hath not dealt us with, a, uh, with us after our sins, nor excuse me, rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens above the earth are, are, is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward them that fear Him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far hath He removed us, uh, removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, and he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as flower of the fields, uh, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall be no more. Be, uh, shall, shall it know no more? 
But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his children's righteousness unto children's and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, to those that remember his commandments to do them. It says, you know, God is merciful to them that fear him. So by all means, be afraid of God. And let him be merciful to you. You know, he won't always be angry, he won't chide forever, he won't always deal with us after our sins. You know, if there's a fear and a repentance, God will be merciful. But there's got to be the fear there. We have to remember, though, that we got to grow out of that, where we're doing things out of fear and start to start to doing things out of love. We got to obey, not because of fear, but because of love. The Bible says in Romans 2, And thinkest thou this, O man, which judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, knowing not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Say, oh man, why does God have to you know come down so hard? Why does God have to be so strict for your own good? Amen. It's for your own good. That's right. And sometimes when we're being corrected by God, when God is straightening us out, it's not you know no chastening for the for the present seem pleasant, but in the end it it, it, it you know, the uh, the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And we can look back and we can say, oh, that's why God chastened me. Because He was trying to get that thing out of my life that was going to absolutely destroy me. That was going to lead me down some dark path. That's why God came down on me like that. And you know, we start out and we, and we get out of fear, but then we can look back and see what God did for us and maybe even having to have chastened us and we'll love Him for it. Yeah. We'll say, thank you for chastening me. Thank you for being a God that I should be afraid of. We grow to the place of obeying by the love. It's not something I think people start out in. I mean, great, maybe I could be wrong about that. Hopefully, you know, people get saved and they just instantly love God so much that they just want to do everything that He commands simply because they love Him. That'd be ideal. But I think there's some times in our life where we have to say, you know what, I need to do the right thing here because I don't want God to come down on me. And give it time and let us grow to the place where we will obey out of love. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 8, I'll read to you, it says, If any man love God, the same is known of him. If any man love God, the same is known of him. You know, people can tell you that they love God all they want. But it's really easy to identify who really loves God and who doesn't. The person who loves God is the one that keeps his commandments. As Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You can say, oh, I love God, I love God, I love God. But you don't do the things that He says. You don't. You certainly don't look like it the way that sometimes when we live our lives, the things that we do. If, we, if, we love, if any man love God, the same is known of Him. I mean, no doubt there's people that we could look at, and I've even heard a set of people, well, I know He loves God. Sometimes someone will say that about somebody. He loves the Lord. How do you know that? Not because He told me. Because I can look at His life and say, look how He, you know, strives to do the right thing all the time. Look how he goes out and reads his Bible and does the soul laying and is in church and is helping others and doing all the things that we have to do, the way they raise their families, the way they live their lives. We can tell whether or not somebody really loves God. Not by what they say, but what we do. When someone really loves God, it's, a, it's, it's evident in their obedience. That's how we know. We can say somebody loves God because they're obedient. And we'll learn to love God when we, when, when, he, when we see that He chastens us for our own good. We'll love God more. We'll say, you know, God is chasing me now, but I and maybe you don't understand it, but we'll say, but it's for my own good. And when we understand it was for our own good that we were chastened, it's just going to cause us to love God even more. Yeah. Or at least it ought to right. be for it to cause us to be grateful. Let's go ahead and turn over to, to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm close here. Look at verse 6. The Bible says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, what a great thing to think about the fact that God, God, 
who deals with you as a son, to being God's child. I mean, that is a wonderful thing to be. Amen. But we have to understand that sometimes that means he has to treat us like a father. He can calm down on us. He deals with us as with sons. Why? Because he loves us. So, we just need to learn to grow in the place in our life that, yes, we're going to obey God, but let it not always be because we fear Him. We ought to grow to the place that we obey God, not out of fear, but out of the fact that we love Him. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer.